so good to be with you. Thank you for inviting us to come and share this morning. We're going to be looking at Psalm 65, so if you still have that open in your Bible, if you want to get a Bible open. As we advance through this psalm, I'm going to be cheating and using English Standard Version, ESV, sometimes the NIV, sometimes a blend of the two. Because sometimes one version just has it way better than another. Especially when we get to verse 8, the NIV is just hands down the best on this song. So, I'm sorry, we're just going to mix it together a little bit. So bear with me, I've called this a missiological psalm of joy. Really, it's kind of a mouthful, so I've made a simpler title, Joy and Missions. And if that's too much even this morning, joy. If you don't remember anything else, somebody wasn't here today, say, well, what was the sermon about? Joy, okay? That's what it was about, joy. Joy is so important in the Christian faith. It's a barometer of our faith but it's one of our greatest sources of strength and testimony to a watching world. And Satan knows that. And so he's going to be attacking joy constantly at every level. So part of why we're here this morning is to understand his devices and to fight what John Piper calls the battle for joy. It is a battle every inch of the way. So I want to help you in that battle and myself too. Okay. Psalm 65 is both a study of sound doctrine, and we're going to be pausing with each verse and saying, well, what doctrine is being taught in this verse? And I'm kind of being a smart aleck, I guess. I'm trying to remember my seminary days. So you'll see big words once in a while, like soteriology, doctrine of salvation. I'll explain them as I go. But I'm trying to impress upon you that this short psalm, 13 verses, is very rich, theologically rich, almost a compendium of systematic theology. And yet it's a missological song of great joy. There's much here about reaching out to people. We tend to compartmentalize. I do it too. We say, oh, well, he's a missionary. He's an evangelist. He's a theologian. He's a seminary professor. And we put people in boxes. And I'm here this morning to say God wants each and every one of us to be a theologian, to, to study God, to love God enough, to use our mind to know him and what his word teaches about everything he says and does. But he wants us to be out sharing. He wants us to be evangelists and missionaries. So everybody here is called to everything I'm going to be speaking about this morning. Keep that in mind. There's nobody gets off the hook here, okay? God wants you and me to be doing both. You know, there's a book that drove me out of the ministry for nine and a half years. I was pastor like Howard. The pastor's secretary became a pastor of a little church in Kutztown. And I was restless for all nine and a half years, faithfully writing sermons every week, doing everything a pastor is supposed to do. And then I read this book by Dr. J.P. Moreland, philosophy professor, a Christian man out at Biola in California. The title of the book was Love the Lord with All Your Mind. And something he said in that book, actually a number of things he said in that book, made me realize God had a different calling for me. And for nine and a half years, the Holy Spirit was convicting. Oh, God is so patient, patiently convicting. You're not exactly where I want you to be. You're close. It's like that game. You're getting warm, warm, hot, cool, cold, hot, hot. God was saying, keep, keep moving, keep moving. I want you to stop preaching sermons, and I want you to be full-time on the campus reaching professors. It took a long while to persuade me and to deal with all my insecurities, how we're going to pay for this, how's this really going to work. So all that to say, in that book, J.P. Marlin says, God's not asking you, anybody who's reading the book, any Christian, he said, God's not asking you to have more brain than you have, to have a higher IQ than you have. He's asking you to love him with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. He wants you to take the mind he gave you and exert mental sweat. Oh, I love that line. Just take whatever God gave you, okay? Whatever it is. And love him with all your strength and all your mind and all your soul and all your heart. And so with your brain, exert mental sweat. I think that's what God calls us to do. In our times of personal Bible study, any Christian books you're reading, you don't have to be the seminary professor. I would never make a good seminary professor. But just exert mental sweat. We're going to try to exert a little mental sweat this morning as we go. So it's a psalm of joy, of missions, of theology, and we need it all. We need the whole package. First verse that Howard read to us. Praise is due to you, O God, in Zion. To you shall vows be performed. 
Now, just to show you how the Lord keeps humbling me, I had to get this PowerPoint ready. I was trying to do it by midweek to ship it to Rick Granberry so he could get it loaded on your computers. I finally succeeded Thursday. I emailed it to him. The computer's loaded. And I found my first boo-boo right here. I said, this is the doctrine of doxology. That would make sense. You know that ending ology, biology, study of life, theology, study of God, doxology, the study of praise and how we praise God and why he's worthy of praise. Somehow I thought that was true and right. Guess what? After I emailed the PowerPoint, I thought, I'm just going to look that up. I'm going to Google doxology. It's primarily the song we just sang. When you type doxology, it's that thing we just sang. And any other short verse or hymn or formula that ascribes praise to God. Nowhere. I mean, I checked several big dictionaries. My wife has a big fat 1950 dictionary she inherited from uh, nowhere. Could I find what I was thinking? I don't think it's true. So I'm already misleading you. Into, can you trust the rest of my sermon? The rest of my power? <laughs> Doxology apparently doesn't mean the theology of praise like I was hoping it would. So either we're going to start a new word this morning or I'm, I'm just dead wrong. <laughs> but anyway, God is worthy of praise, and I think that's a worthy subject to study. The second verse said, Oh, you who hear prayer, to you shall all flesh come. And I'm thinking, well, what doctrine is that? I'm going to keep it simple. It's the doctrine of prayer. God hears prayer. He answers prayer. There's no other place in the universe we can go where we're going to really be heard and answered. And therefore, to you all flesh shall come. It's curious, because we see an awful lot of mankind not coming, a lot of people not praying, a lot of people refusing to believe in prayer. But boy, you get them in a crisis. That old adage, no atheists in foxholes, is true time and time again. You come upon the scene of a car accident, and who are people calling out to? So often, calling out to God, because now they're in pain, now they're afraid of dying. So people do, when push comes to shove. They've been suppressing that. The Bible tells us they're actively suppressing, but now, finally, it's erupting. They do come to God. We, as his children, hopefully are coming much quicker. Is my life marked by seasons of heartfelt praise? And again, I'm using, misusing the word doxology here. But is your life my life? Is that something people notice? That we're praising people. This Muslim professor that Lars spoke about commented to me one time, her office is upstairs in the science building, and when she comes down to the first floor on a Thursday evening, often the disciple makers, large group, is there singing praises to God. And as a Muslim, she's struck by that. How beautiful. These students are singing. And my answer to that is, we have something to sing about. There's really no other group on this campus that is singing with such heartfelt praise. There is a glee club, there's a chorus, but just spontaneously coming together, wanting to praise God. That's a hallmark of a believer. Is my life marked by seasons of fervent prayer? I'm not trying to lay a guilt trip on anyone this morning, but is it something you find yourself wanting to do? Oh, here I'm reverting to the King James. I'm sorry. There's just nothing beats the King James on this verse. The effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. We have so many reasons. I didn't know. I have to come here to find out what my wife is really thinking. I didn't know that Lord is praying for Will to not only get better and to get saved. I'm praying for him to get saved. Sometimes I pray for him maybe to get better, mostly just to get saved. Laura, I've never prayed for him to go back on campus as a professor. So I'm going to join you in that prayer. Like, wow, <laughs> she's praying for this guy to be like resurrected from the dead. And if he is, I'm going to add one more prayer that he'll come here to Bethany and meet you people and you'll get to meet this guy. So pray with us that Will will have the strength to come back and meet you folks on the day he gets saved. Now, this is a curious one, isn't it? When we were overwhelmed by sins, you atone for our transgressions. Anybody here ever feel overwhelmed by sins? I think the way our Christian culture works, we say, no, that's the unbeliever, maybe. Yeah, when the, like you said, they're in the car accident and they're afraid of death. They feel overwhelmed, perhaps, by sin. But I'm, I'm a Christian. I'm saved. And that's all taken care of. I'm going to read you a little snippet from R.C. Sproul. Anybody here an R.C. Sproul fan? <laughs> Good. He went home to be with the Lord, and that jarred me back in December when I heard that news. Our neighbor died, I think it was December 13th, and I think R.C. Sproul died the very next day. And when I heard that, I said, R.C. Sproul. Somewhere in my basement in my collection of books, I had this paperback, The Holiness of God by R.C. Sproul, but I'd never read it. So I went down and I found it and I began reading it. And I'm two thirds of the way through. And if you knew me, that's, that's remarkable. There's a lot of books I don't finish. And 
two thirds, and I'm, I'm really eating it up. I also want to commend something else to you. Carry a paperback, put the smartphone away, get out the paperback book and go to the bank and stand in line for Dollar General. I'm at Dollar General recently and I'm reading this because there's two people ahead of me. I've got my little basket and I'm waiting for them and I'm just reading another page of Holiness of God by R.C. Sproul. It works almost every time. You get up to the counter, the clerk says, what are you reading? The holiness of God. I said, this man just went home to be with the Lord a month ago, and he knows what he's talking about now. He, he's got it. But I mean, just that little bit. There's so many few people in our culture are reading. Just, we're not that literate. We're not reading. I had the mortification of sin by John Owen, a little abridged paperback. And I'm at the bank. This is probably five, six years ago now. Walk into the bank on a Monday morning, but now mid-morning there's nobody there except the retirees. I had four tellers all smiling at me, all with an empty counter. I mean, I could have had any of the four to do my little bank deposit. I had my book with me in case it was a long line, but there wasn't. So I walk up to the counter. I picked the one who had the biggest smile, the teller with the biggest smile. I walked up, laid my book down, got out my check, and said, I want to deposit this. She said, what are you reading? And you know, my heart actually sank. I thought, oh, wait a minute. Even Christians have a tough time with this idea of the mortification of sin. But here's a probably an unbeliever. Ask me what I'm reading. I took a deep breath. I said, we Christians, I immediately identified as a Christian. I said, we Christians are a really strange bunch of people. We believe our sins are all forgiven, past, present, future. We're ready to die and go to heaven at the drop of a hat. But in spite of that, we have this battle against indwelling sin. We are trying to put sin to death every day, and that's called Mortification of Sin. And the book you asked me, what am I reading? It's called The Mortification of Sin by John Owen. This gal looked at me, and she said, could I see it? Nothing better to do. I hand her the book. She takes that book and reads the whole back cover and then hands it back to me. Not a word. She just hands it back to me. I said, when I'm done, you can borrow it. She didn't say anything. <laughs> I went home and I read that back cover. And I said, oh, what a beautiful gospel tract. I wonder what the Holy Spirit is saying to that girl as she read that back cover, that mortification of sin by John Owen. Two weeks later, I'm back in the bank and I get her again. This time, all we had was a small ESV Bible, real small font that I can't even read anymore. But I had this little ESV Bible and she smiled and said, now what are you reading? <laughs> I said, the original. I said, this is where... John Owen got all his ideas from. <laughs> but the opportunities when we're reading Christian books, just because we want to redeem the time, you get in these lines. If you have your book, you can get it out, and then people may ask you good questions. OK, when we were overwhelmed by sins, I've been reading R.C. Scroll. And in case you're not overwhelmed by sin, I'm actually going to tell you this morning it's a good thing to be overwhelmed by sin. You don't want to stay there. The second half of the verse says, you atone for our transgressions. It's good to be overwhelmed by sins just long enough to run back to the cross and receive the cleansing we need. But Sproul says in this book, sin is cosmic treason. Sin is treason against a perfectly pure sovereign. It is an act of supreme ingratitude toward the one to whom we owe everything, to the one who's given his life, given us life in itself. Have you ever considered the deeper implications of the slightest sin, of the most minute picadillo? picadillo? What are we saying to our Creator when we disobey him at the slightest point? We are saying no to the righteousness of God. We are saying, God, your law is not good. My judgment is better than yours. Your authority does not apply to me. I'm above and beyond your jurisdiction. I have the right to do what I want to do, not what you command me to do. The slightest sin is an act of defiance against cosmic authority. It is a revolutionary act, a rebellious act, in which we are setting ourselves in opposition to the one to whom we owe everything. It is an insult to his holiness. You know, reading stuff like this makes sin more overwhelming. And I believe as we come to grasp the holiness of God better, and that was the heartbeat of R.C. Sproul's ministry, we are going to be more overwhelmed by sin. But that won't leave us there. We're not paralyzed. Satan is always seeking to paralyze us one way or the other. Satan either wants to lull us to sleep, oh, my sins aren't that bad. They're really just all peccadillos. Or to begin to grasp the magnitude of our sin and then be paralyzed. The answer is in the second half. You atone for our transgressions. I'm going to keep running back to the cross over and over and over again. One other true story I've probably shared here before. But sometimes the slightest thing in your life, people are watching you so closely. Uh, 
My dad was a pastor in Maine. We moved there in 1959. I was 12 years old. Now you can figure out my age. And right down the hill from us lived this really beautiful 12-year-old girl in Maryland. She caught my attention right away. But I, I really socially awkward. I didn't know what to do about that. She's real pretty. She gets on the school bus when I do. We go to school. At some point, she came to our church and actually became a Christian. And somebody turned to her and asked her, why did you come to Christ? She said, it was John Stunger. I was just watching him, and he was always so happy. I said, really? I didn't know she, I was watching her because she was pretty. I didn't know she was watching me at all. And I didn't know that I was so happy, and I didn't know she was watching me, and I didn't know God, the Holy Spirit, is using that to bring her to Christ. And then later in college with a Hindu roommate, and this is the one you've probably heard, but it bears repeating because it's so much fun. I wake up one morning, and here's Negi, my Hindu roommate from India, just staring at me from his bed. And he looked at me and said, John, you sleep so well at night. I said, I do. <laughs> you don't think about these things, and I didn't know he was watching me either. He said, yes, you do. And he said, and I know why, too. Because you have a clean conscience. And I, he said, I don't sleep well at night. And he said, you sleep so well because you have a clean conscience, and I don't. What's left to say? I mean, he's not only watching the sleep, he's connecting the dots and figuring out why. There wasn't a whole lot for me to say, but I just said, Negi, you're hitting the nail on the head. Sleep is not a major doctrine in the Christian faith, but there are some passages, and I turned to the Psalms, I laid me down and I sleep. There's Psalms about the sleep. I said, it's a corollary, it's sort of a side benefit of our faith that sound sleep is a gift of God for exactly the reason you said. A clean, and where does that clean conscience come from? You atone for our transgressions. It's the heartbeat of the gospel. A year later, Negi left Cornell. A year later, he wrote to me and he said, John, I have become a Christian. The Holy Spirit is working. I said, you know what my contribution was? We always hear how 17 people have to witness to you before somebody has to witness to you before you become a Christian. My contribution was sleeping. <laughs> <laughs> That's the heartbeat of a Christian faith. I think I need to aim this a little better. Okay, atonement is the doctrine we're looking at there. But you know, there's a big word for sin. This one's true. I, I couldn't remember it. We learned it in seminary and I was trying to, what's that word? What's that word? Har hamartiology. There's a Greek word, harmatia, for sin, and that's turned into an English word, har har harmatiology. You can look it up. What would that be? That's all about original sin, and that's all about your sin and my sin and why we sin and how to mortify sin, and it's everything about sin. It's a field of theology. It sounds yucky. Why would I want to study that? But I'll tell you what, if you do, you're going to appreciate the atonement a whole lot more. So I'm asking this question, are you sensitive to sin in your own life? Are you ever overwhelmed by it? And are you totally resting in Christ's atonement? Because I think it's possible to go through seasons of briefly being overwhelmed and saying, God, how could you possibly love me? Oh, thank you. You do. Thank you. You do. And you're faithful. And never, ever, he who comes to me, I will in no wise cast out. This is from Psalm 38. I just had to throw this in. For my iniquities have gone over my head like a heavy burden. They're too heavy for me. We need to feel that. We need to feel that to appreciate the joy of our redemption. Now, blessed is one you choose and bring near to dwell in your courts. Who wants to guess what doctrine I'm going to put up in green letters there? The first half of the verse. Blessed is one you choose. What doctrine would that be? Predestined. Election. It's off the screen. But on the bottom there, you'll see some green letters. It's election. I chose. Of course, you can't know what I'm thinking. But that's what came to my mind. And that's a very beautiful doctrine. God is choosing, choosing people. And one of the big issues with the election is often rattles our assurance. And you'll hear some of the greatest saints asking the question, how can I know I'm one of the elect? John Calvin had to wrestle a great deal with that. And his counsel to people was, presume upon the veracity of God. Just presume upon the truthfulness of God. If you're troubled by this and you're coming to God and you want to be one of the elect and you're asking to be one, you are one. So welcome. Spurgeon has a booklet called Election. And there he says, does, does holiness matter to you? Are you concerned about holiness? Do you really desire holiness? You're one of the elect. Welcome aboard. See, there's little litmus tests all along the way. How can I know I'm one of these 
People were blessed. How do I know I've been chosen? But notice the second half of the verse, because right here is another subtle test. Blessed is the one you choose and take to heaven when they die. It's not what it says. Blessed is the one you choose and bring near to dwell in your courts. My question this morning is, is that you? Are you here this morning because you really want to be here? Hopefully you are. You're the perfect excuse to stay home with a snowstorm. You can say, oh, I just couldn't get dug out in time. So hopefully everybody who's here and preaching to the choir really, really wants to be here and is happy to be here. But on the off chance there's somebody here because of some lesser reason, and you really would rather be somewhere else. One of the indications you're one of the elect is you delight to be here. You delight to be in the courts of the Lord. You delight to be every opportunity part of the community. God has planted you in community. Is my being brought near and my dwelling in his courts a sure sign to me of my election? Is it part of my assurance? You know, it's easy to be pretty perfunctory about all these things. Membership, oh yeah, right, a little detail. It's much more than a detail to God. God says, I want you to be part of a group that's giving an account for you. I want your soul to be shepherded. I have anointed shepherds, human shepherds, working under the auspices of the great shepherd of the sheep to pray for you, to hold you accountable. Now, that's not always on the surface. We're not hopefully being called into the office by the pastor or the elders every week to give an account. But you know they are watching, and you know they will hold you accountable. And you're glad about it. And you're glad to be here when you can be. You can't be here every time the doors are open, but when you can, your life is enmeshed with the people of God and it's exactly where you want it. That's a sign of your election. You've been chosen and brought near. You come to the courts of God because you want to. So I put your church membership attendance as a delight, not a chore, not a duty to be checked off. God says this in Psalm 68, a father to the fatherless, a defender of widows is God in his holy dwelling. God sets the lonely in families. This is what our salvation, our redemption is doing all the time. It's taking very lonely people. Believe me, I meet them constantly. So many lonely people on the campus, very lonely professors. This one that Will, will the Lord mentioned, he'll do anything to get me to come see him. He doesn't always like my witnessing to him, but he will go to the surplus food bank and get my favorite food. John, I got something for you to pick up. Just anything, anything to get me there. God wants that man in a family. God sets the lonely in families. He leads out the prisoners with singing, but the rebellious live in a sun-scorched land. So it's a hallmark of our election. That we're part of that family. The next verse, or the second half of verse 4, back to Psalm 65 here. We shall be satisfied with the goodness of your house, the holiness of your temple. Well, anything about church is what we call ecclesiology, the doctrine of the church, the gathering of God's people. But notice these words, goodness and holiness. Those go together. Sproul, in his little book, The Holiness of God, asks the question, does God's holiness attract you or terrify you? <laughs> the truth is both. Both. God's holiness terrifies me. But God's holiness is so good. It is so sweet. It is so right. And I hunger for it. So, what's this about the church then? I'm going to throw a controversial church father statement on the screen here. But I want you to notice the dates on this guy, Cyprian. He's well before the Reformation. He's well before the apostatizing of the medieval Catholic Church that really corrupted this whole thing. I think the reason we take a gulp with this is we know what happened over the centuries when the church said, we are the mother church and we have all the merits of Christ here in our Federal Reserve Bank and we have the merits of the saints and you give us some money and do this and we'll dispense these merits. That is a blasphemy, but this is not blasphemous. Cyprian didn't know how far his words would be carried. He simply made the statement, you cannot have God for your father unless you have the church for your mother. God made it that way. God said, if you want to be my child, you have to join my other children. And you have to do it the way I set up. How many people do you meet who say, I'm spiritual, just not religious. I don't go to church because it's so full of hypocrisy. I had one professor of philosophy when I approached him. He said, Dr. Beck, he said, just tell me, where do you stand in relation to the doctrines of the Judeo-Christian faith? And he's a smart man. I knew he knew exactly what I meant, and he did. And he didn't hesitate to answer me. My question is, where do you stand in relation to the doctrines of the Judeo-Christian faith? He fired right back, I love them. But I hate the institution, and you represent the institution. 
I knew where this chaplain stood. <laughs> but I, was, I was glad for the first part. I love them. There's something he's loving. He wants God of his father, and he wants our doctrines, but he doesn't want anything to do with the church. Not a good sign of his election yet, but keep praying for that gentleman. Ponder that statement. It's impossible, I believe, to read the Bible and obey it and not have the church as my mother. What do you do? Sometimes I meet Christians, and you know, everything would say they are a Christian. Their testimony, their behavior is good. Can't really fault them, but they never want to go to church. They don't want to join the church. They don't want that institutional authority over them. And so I say, um, this verse, Hebrews 13, 17, obey your leaders and submit to them, for they're keeping watch over your souls, because those will have to give an account how are you obeying that? And can you even name your leaders? It's one thing to submit to them, but do you even know who they are? Can you tell me their names? I'm going to Kutztown Bible Fellowship Church. We have three elders. I'm not one of them. I'm not on the elder board. There's only one guy there older than me. A lot of you know Dean and Donna Stortz. Dean Stortz is my elder. In Kutztown, you not only have a board of elders, you have a shepherding elder. Each saint has an elder detail to them. So Dean is my elder. I can tell you who I need to give account to, who's praying for me. You need that. I need that. We all need that. That's the way God set it up. And notice the second half of this verse. Let them do this with joy and not with grooming, for that would be of no advantage to you. I've digressed pretty far from my original announced title, Joy. You might say, overwhelmed with sin and all the stuff about the church. And where's the joy? Well, um, let me tell you, if you do what God asks you to do to bring joy to your elders, you're going to have joy. We're still talking about joy here. And God wants it throughout the whole system. It's part of our faith. It's part of our walk. Verse 5 says, By awesome deeds you answer us with righteousness, O God of our salvation. It's still in the doctrine of prayer. But I'm going to take a little bit deeper and say it's providence. The unfolding of life, the circumstances, including answers to prayer. But just sometimes things we didn't even think to pray for. And you see God just stepping in and blessing and orchestrating. Heard this morning from Genesis, the whole story of Joseph. Sold into slavery. Brothers who hated his guts, almost killed him, wanted him dead, out of our life. And God's going to use him to feed them and take care of them. And that's providence. God says, even the downturns, even those very negative things. I'm doing awesome deeds of righteousness. I'd like to challenge you that you don't keep any kind of diary or record of answered prayers. In the past 12 months, what example can you give of at least one awesome deed of righteousness as an answer from God our Savior? We used to do that a lot when I lived in a Maranatha house back in my single days when Laura really was my fiance. Uh, she was in a girl's house at Ithaca, New York called Maranatha 2, and I was in Maranatha 1, a guy's house. And we just kept a notebook of answered prayer, and it was an amazing document. And one of the brothers, this is like 40 years ago, one of the brothers, maybe 10 years ago, photocopied that, distributed. My daughter got a hold of it, and she was so touched as she read her daddy as a single college student, the detailed, sometimes marvelous answers to prayer. She said, this is part of my legacy. See, our children need our legacy. They need to know that you're a prayerful person who can point to some awesome deeds that God answers. The budget for our little Cutstown church this year, we're struggling because our older people are retiring, and their retirement incomes are much smaller than their normal incomes. And our young people are just beginning to get traction. They're graduating, they join the church, and some of them are sticking with us, but they have lousy jobs. They don't have much money yet. The whole thing needs a financial law. So we had this pretty skimpy budget to start with, but the elders called a meeting in the second half of the year and said, you know, we're just, at the rate we're going, we're going to fall $15,000 short. We've got to pair the budget to the bone. And so they do it, boom, boom, boom. They cut everything down to the bone. Still kept paying our pastor's salary. But... Dean Stortz, my elder, got to the microphone. He's an Ephesians 3.20 type of guy. And he said, uh, this is all good. What we're doing here this is important. But let's not forget Ephesians 3.20. What does that say? That he can answer us in ways that we cannot imagine, in ways that we can hardly dream. God wants to bless us abundantly. So he just spoke those words and encouraged the people to pray for the 15,000 by the end of the year. He said, just pray that God will give us the 15,000 so we can go back and pay all the missionaries and everything that we are plopping out of the budget, that we can pay it by the end of the year. Anonymous gift, first week of December, $20,000 came to the church. God said, you need $15,000, I'm going to give you $20,000. 
Another lady gave 5,000 more for our renovations, and she's from outside the church. Her total giving, they told us, was 25,000 over the last five years, giving to the renovations at Kutztown. God is blessing us, and we just need to ask him. Oh, and Laura mentioned the Collegiate Day of Prayer. I just want you folks to know that's a nationwide thing, collegiatedayofprayer.org. You can look at that. God wants to do great things on all our campuses, and we need to be praying and trusting him to do phenomenal things, and things are really happening. There's the Ephesians 3.20. Now to him who's able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think, according to the power at work within us. People's estimation of Dean's stories went way up from that one <laughs> when that gift came in. The hope of all the ends of the earth under the farthest seas. What kind of doctrine is that? That's our missiology again, our global God. Everything that has to do with missionary work, God says, I'm, I have a missionary heart. I'm there long before you get there. I'm the one who is reaching people at the very end of the globe. The one who by his strength established the mountain as being girded with might. Notice the strength and the might, but also the creation, the mountains. And so I'm putting doctrines of creation and God's omnipotence. He is the mighty creator God, and there's nothing too hard for him. Who stills the roaring of the seas, the roaring of their waves, the tumult of the peoples, turmoil of the nations, I think the NIV said there. God's sovereignty, his providence. You know, we can sleep like babies every night despite mass shootings. It, it's horrible. We grieve for the people and the turmoil in the world. There's a group of elite nuclear scientists who keep track of the danger of nuclear war. I don't know if you heard this, but this elite group said we are in more danger right now of nuclear war, World War III, if you will, than we were except for the 1950s. There was a period of time when I guess when the Soviet Union announced we had the hydrogen bomb, that things were super tense. Well, he said, it's, it's at that level now. And of course, that's our president speaking to the president of North Korea, and the president of North Korea is speaking to our president. And all this stuff is creating a climate, an atmosphere, where the guys who monitor our pulse emotionally say we're in more danger of nuclear war than we've been since the 1950s. That makes a lot of people lose sleep at night. God doesn't want you to lose sleep. There's a lot to pray about. But then having prayed, we must sleep. God says, I'm the one who stills the turmoil of the nations. So that those who dwell at the ends of the earth are in awe at your signs. I put, that's another fancy word. That's the Holy Spirit. Pneumatology, the doctrine of the Holy Spirit, his convincing, his convicting. People who are in awe at his signs have been worked upon by the Holy Spirit. And again, missiology to the ends of the earth. I lived in Alberta for four years. My dad went to Prairie Bible Institute. One of the neat things about living in Alberta is maybe three times during a given winter, you're going to see the northern lights. And the northern lights, if you've never seen them, just shimmering curtains of purple and green and orange. Oh my goodness, it's gorgeous. And people are in awe. And people say, right outside. The northern lights are here. Come out and see it. And so we praise this thing. God says they're ultimately praising me. They don't know it yet. And then this is where the NIV shines. Where morning dawns and evening fades, you call forth songs of joy. That's everywhere, folks. You don't have to be in Alberta to see that one. Everywhere the sun rises, everywhere the sun sets. And everywhere there's once in a while a glorious sunrise or a glorious sunset. And where that happens, God gets our attention. He says, I'm calling forth songs of joy. <coughs> I'm going to argue that that joy is felt by the unbeliever. They have joy. We need to remember that. Paul talks about this in Acts. He says, yet he did not leave himself without witness, for he did good by giving you rains from heaven and fruitful seasons, satisfying your hearts with food and gladness. Unbelievers experience gladness. They experience joy. And it's a testimony. We need to show them. You, oh, the psalmist says this, though. You put more joy in my heart than, when they, than they have when their grain and wine abound. There is common grace, there is joy, and then there's special grace, and a much deeper joy, and much everlasting joy. And we need to explain the difference to people. Now, from here on out, we're going to move fast. The rest of the psalm is, I think, the doctrine of joy. You visit the earth and water it. You greatly enrich it. The river of God is full of water. You provide their grain, for so you have prepared it. 
You visit the earth and water it, you greatly enrich it. Okay, the river God is full of water, you provide the grain, for so you've prepared it. I'm saying as God's philanthropia, his love for all mankind, sometimes you just call it common grace. You drench its furrows and level its ridges, you soften it with showers and bless its crops. The pastures of the wilderness overflow. The hills gird themselves with joy. The meadows are covered with flocks, and the valleys are mantled with grain. They shout for joy and sing. I'm just going to call it the doctrine of joy, okay? It's out there. It's everywhere. People do experience it. And it actually leads us to something I want to leave you with today. The doctrines of joy and common grace lead us to the philosophical problem of good, which is the flip side of the coin of the philosophical problem of evil. The philosophical problem of evil, you're going to hear a lot. People say, well, now that God's all-powerful and all-loving as you're telling me, then why, why, why? Why tsunamis? Why earthquakes? Why children who came at the age of three? Why? We don't have the answers to all the riddles. But we have a question for them. If there is no God, as you're telling me, you're an atheist, and you're telling me you don't think there's any God, where does good come from? Where this joy, this sense of provision, this bounty, this beautiful sunset, this beautiful sunset, this beautiful infant, the joy of children, the joy of raising a family, where did that come from? It's as real a problem as the one of evil. Our job is to help people understand one, the author of all their present joy is one who loves them, philanthropia. And, if I get this to advance, the same author offers us a much deeper and greater joy. The one joy is to lead to the other. Paul says in Romans 2, 4, do you not know that the kindness of God is meant to lead you to repentance? Do you not know that all his favor that you're experiencing is to take you deeper into salvation? Okay. The chief, who wants to guess who said this? The chief end of missions is the supremacy of God and the joy of all peoples. Who does that sound like? John Piper. And the same with the believer, there's a daily battle for joy. That's John Piper. His whole ministry is a joy-centered type of ministry. I'm going to close with this. Restore to me the joy of your salvation. Uphold me with a willing spirit. This is after David is totally overwhelmed by his sin. He has sinned majorly with Bathsheba. Psalm 51 is his psalm of contrition, repentance, and restoration. But he's saying, even though I don't deserve it one bit, restore to me the joy of your salvation. Uphold me with a willing spirit. Then I will teach transgressors your ways, and sinners will return to you. This is so essential to our outreach, to our missionary work. If we don't have this joy, things are going to fall flat. Now, I can imagine what Satan is saying to David. You're going to teach transgressors? You hypocrite. I mean, you're the, you're the biggest transgressor ever. You murdered a man. You committed adultery. And you think you qualify to teach a transgressor? Who are you? I mean, Satan's going to try to do that to you and me, too. Who, who do you think you are? It's not about who I am. It's about the God who forgives. I'm an example, as Paul said, the chief of sinners. I'm an example of the atonement. I'm an example of this forgiveness. An example of what I'm talking about. I wonder. Someday we'll find out. That's not my picture. That's yours. <laughs> Someday we're going to find out if David led anybody else to the Lord after the whole Bathsheba thing. But I have a hunch he did. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the joy you want to give us, the joy that we need to cultivate, the attacks of Satan that we need to guard against to rob us of joy. Lord, please help us with this whole thing, to love you, to rest in you, and to reflect you accurately to a watching world. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen.